Hello everybody, in today's exciting episode of JM on Cars, you're going to bear witness to me going totally out of my depth as I jump into the murky waters of the wonderful world of camper vans. Now I, like many of you I'm sure, have often thought about the idea of a camper van because doesn't it seem like a great thing to have? After all, what better way to go and watch a weekend's worth of racing at Silverstone, go to Glastonbury, or do any number of things? I'm sure you've gone through the whole process. You've convinced yourself that you will use it every weekend. You'll love it, it'll be brilliant. You can do a road trip around the country, maybe even Europe, and you'll save yourself loads of money. It's a fabulous idea, until you realize how expensive these things actually are. In case you weren't aware, if you want VW to build you a brand new camper, a bit like this one, uh, expect to pay something like £70,000. And um, that wouldn't even be a top spec one. Uh, camper vans, VW camper vans in particular, it seems, are not a cheap thing at all. Uh, but this one is not your average camper. This one belongs to my friend Josh, and he has done pretty much everything you see to it. He got it a few years ago when it was an ordinary panel van, and he had only a couple of requirements for it. He wanted the DSG gearbox, and he also wanted this beautiful chestnut brown, a very 1970s color, but somehow absolutely perfect on here. As you can tell, it is no longer your average ordinary panel van. And that's a journey that started with one simple request. He wanted a cup of coffee. Now, most ordinary people would simply go to a coffee shop and get one. But for Josh, that wasn't really the solution that he wanted. He wanted to make sure that wherever he went in the world, he could have his coffee just how he liked it, and somewhere nice, quiet, and tranquil to enjoy it in. So he set about the process of building this, what is possibly the world's most extravagant Nespresso machine. Now, some of what he's done is reasonably standard VW bus fare, like the installation of these Audi RS5 seats up front. Now, this wasn't actually as simple as it might look. He welded up custom bases for both of them and the passenger seat, as you can tell, swivels around, making this place the ideal venue for a casual cocktail party. He's also done a few things that are perhaps a little bit different, like rather than having a regular fridge, he has a wine chiller instead. From here, it looks pretty much like your regular camper conversion, but that only goes to show how much detail has gone in to making this thing a really nice product. Josh has not been satisfied with good enough at pretty much any stage of the product, like the flooring, which is shop parquet flooring, individually laid tiles. There's loads of storage space, which is pretty essential when it's only ultimately a fairly small vehicle. All of your electrics are in here, and he's done those himself because he is a qualified electrician. And I should point out that if you are tempted to build your own camper van, you really should involve one of those at some point. After all, you wouldn't let a hobbyist do your house. There's an inverter, isolator, all sorts of stuff down here. And one of the cooler bits that he's built into this camper is a hidden water feed here, taking advantage of what was previously a totally dead space. He actually sells these to the VW camper community and they are pretty popular. And I can see exactly why, because, well, why would you put that somewhere you can see it on the outside if you can hide it away? Some people also choose to put an electricity feed here and he does have one at the front, but his actual solution is far cleverer. On top of this ultra lightweight, low profile carbon fiber roof, you're going to find a pair of pretty large solar panels. They feed a couple of leisure batteries down here, which then go through a power management system that's really designed for use on super yachts and will control the entire thing. When the batteries are charged, they have apparently about 45 cups of coffee in them. And to date, Josh has never actually needed to plug the van into a wall socket. In fact, the system is so efficient that it is the solar panels which keep the car charged rather than the car charging the leisure batteries. Sleeping arrangements are equally as elegant. The seats here will fold down and provide you one double bed and you've got another upstairs. 
you've actually got a surprising amount of room in here. You've got a basic mattress here to which you can add, of course, whatever you like. And then you can have it either closed off for a little bit of privacy or you can go in full safari mode. I gotta say, we're filming this in the middle of winter and actually with the sun out, this is a pretty awesome place to be. Nice knowing too that if you are at a motorsports event or concert or anything of the sort, if the weather does turn bad, gets a bit windy, starts to rain, in less than a minute you can be shut up, nice and warm, and have your coffee on the go. Uh, there are still a few things missing from the van, it's not quite finished yet. There's an induction hob due to go in soon, and a couple of little bits of trim are being sorted. But overall, this really is a very nicely made thing. Now, of course, one part of the camper van experience that people always forget about is the drive. And in a moment, we are going to take this out onto the road and see what she's like. After all, it's no good having a beautiful first class portable room if getting it to the Isle of Skye is a nightmarish, horrible experience. But I don't think that's going to be the case with Josh's vehicle. Now, how much is it going to cost you to get into something like this? Well, Auto Trader would tell you it's between about 40 and 50 grand to get something of roughly similar age and mileage. The truth is, we can't really put a price on this one because it is genuinely a unique vehicle. It's probably going to go up for sale next year, and when it does, I'll tell you all about that. If you want to know more about the construction process, I highly suggest that you check out Josh's channel, which is Detail Core, and the description and link for that will be down below. I'm a really big fan of the Japanese equivalent to this, the Toyota Alphard, and you can pick up one of those for pretty good money. In fact, 40 odd grand would get you a brand spanking new, pretty highly specified one. So is this actually anywhere near as good on the road? Time to find out. There are a few things I'll admit I failed to mention in the walk around. This van is what they call a Highline specification. In all honesty, that means absolutely nothing to me, but I'm told that's the second from the top in terms of trim levels. However, this van has then received some of the panels and aero tarty bits from the top level sport line. The reason he got a high line and did that was because he wanted this chestnut brown color and it appears that nobody spec a sport line in this shade. I know a lot of you will think that I spend all of my life driving around in the finest of the fine in Maybachs and Mercs and Ferraris and Porsches and all sorts of stuff, but, but actually a large part of my youth was spent behind the wheel of many a van, so I'm actually quite familiar with them. VW vans, it has to be said, are actually pretty nice. The interior, by van standards, is good. It's roughly equivalent to what you'll find in a fairly cheap VW car. There are things which are decent, the steering wheel is actually pretty nice, the dials are exactly as you'd find in a Golf from about sort of 10 years ago. A couple of other upgrades have been made in the form of the infotainment system and of course the seats too. They are marvellous, really figure hugging and they suit this down to a T. Now one modification that I'm not exactly in love with is the alloy wheels. They are Riviera 20 inch items, RV20s apparently. The ride isn't ruined, but neither is it quite as good as it could be. The rear in particular suffers because the back is very low profile. The front's actually not too bad. Personally, I just leave 18s on here if you want to go flash, 17s perhaps if you actually want some proper ride comfort. The gearbox in here works pretty well, although in typical German car fashion, these aren't actually as bulletproof as you might think. The box itself is reasonably reliable, but the dual mass flywheel that sits next to it is somewhat less so. This fan has already had a replacement which was fitted at only 11,000 miles in. There isn't really a fix for it, that apparently is just what happens to them. They get somewhat noisy and they can eventually fail, but this one is currently behaving itself nicely. Now something else you may or may not be able to hear is the uh, Darth Vader-like noises coming from the front. That's because this car is currently wearing a 
very large air filter. Now it's an item that Josh has helped design, he's built a custom velocity stack for it to fit it in here. It's something that would usually go in a regular VW car, but he's made it work in the van. I, I gotta say it's not to taste and after a few miles it would definitely get on my wick. The engine here is the 150 horsepower version and no remapping has occurred. You could also get a 200 brake version of these and I think they also do a petrol turbo now too. The T6 I believe is mechanically similar to the T5 which preceded it, but there were a number of different upgrades and changes, none of which I can really tell you about because I'm nowhere near familiar enough with the model. Suffice it to say, if you want one but you can only afford the other, I don't think you're probably going to be missing out on anything significant. The van certainly pulls well enough for a van, but you've got to remember it's a big vehicle with a whole bunch of stuff in the back and only the 150 horses up front, but it certainly does the job. It's reasonably smooth, the steering is actually pretty nice too by van standards and the gearbox really is quite decent. It's only in the last few years it seems that vans have started to become available as a normal thing with automatic gearboxes. I did a lot of van driving about 10 years ago and then finding an auto box was a pretty rare thing and the ones I did drive, like the Renault Traffic, were actually awful. The view out is not too bad so long as you're trying to look forwards. You've actually got a bit of a rear three-quarter view over there but the rear is blacked out so you're not going to see anything that way. You do however get parking sensors and a reversing camera. The Android infotainment system here works well enough, it does the job and is better than the standard thing you'll get in here. You've also cruise control, air conditioning, and those, by the way, are definitely not standard when it comes to vans. There's also a heated windscreen, which is going to be pretty good if you are the sort of person that wants to take this away for an Arctic adventure. And perhaps for many people, the best part about buying into the VW experience is that because they are so commonplace, pretty much anything you want for them, you can get. And that means not just spare parts and the like, but also modification stuff. There's things for them everywhere. Fuel economy is reasonable, averaging it seems about 40 to the gallon. That's not bad for a bus. There are a few rattles and things in here, which tends to be par for the course with camper vans, although some of them are things that are being fixed. This is, like I said, something of a work in progress. If you are going to go your own way and build a camper van, you may think why you'd bother starting off with a reasonably expensive base. Even the regular transport is not a cheap thing. A Transit is going to be cheaper still, you can get an old Transit, you can get a Persia, you can get a Citroen, you can get pretty much anything. And ultimately what you're going to end up with is pretty much the same. But there is something you have to remember. These things have a real cult following, and that means that they do hold their money fairly well. So if you are looking at building yourself a camper and you don't want to keep it forever, because you're highly unlikely to, then a VW makes a pretty good base because they are something that's pretty easy to sell on. Doing the same thing with a Mercedes, I'm sure, would yield you a van that's just as easy to use, to drive and to live with, but you'll find even if you spend exactly the same amount on it, it is just going to be worth a bit less at the end. I know there are a whole bunch of people out there who go real misty-eyed for the old splitties and things like that, but I've never really been that into them. And they were worth far too much money even when no classics were about 15 to 20 years ago, and I'm pretty sure they are nowhere near as nice to drive as these. They're pretty rustic things by all accounts. If you actually want to do some serious travelling, I think this is the way to do it. This is a pretty comfortable, luxurious thing. Okay, it's not a sports car driving experience, but then it never should be. This is a very nice way to get an espresso machine wherever you want it. And I think Josh has done a, a pretty damn good job of it. And that, I think, really, is all I can probably say on the subject. So I hope you've enjoyed this little look at something way outside my comfort zone. If you have a vehicle similar you'd like to see me struggle through, then please do drop me a line. And if you want to know more about the build process for this, do check out Josh's channel, and you'll find the link for that down below. Anyway, that's enough from me. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.